This is Guy Burgess. In this post, I'd like to explore the relationship between peace building and peace builders who tend to approach conflict from intermediary or third party perspectives and constructive confrontation, which tends to approach conflict from the perspective of advocates or adversaries. I'd like to explain this by first telling you a bit about the history of the Conflict Information Consortium here at the University of Colorado. It began life in the late 1980s uh, under a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation's Conflict Resolution Program. And they were supporting, in fact, they wound up supporting us for almost 20 years, uh, university-based theory building centers uh, focused on various aspects of conflict and conflict resolution. At any rate, when we got our first big grant from Hewlett um, and we called our consortium the Conflict Resolution Consortium because that's what Hewlett called their program, uh, we started to try to organize, you know, public events, seminars, that sort of thing. And we had countered a surprising amount of pushback. Our environmental and social justice friends said, uh, wait, well, they weren't interested. Uh, they had come to see conflict resolution and mediation as a time-consuming, resource-wasting process. They were afraid that they would be forced into some sort of unwanted compromise, and they didn't use this phrase, but it later emerged something called the sugar coating of injustice. And we would ask people to participate, and we'd get like a 95% rejection rate, which was pretty demoralizing. Um, and what was more is people just sort of thought what we were doing was illegitimate. Um, and then we got the bright idea one day to reframe what we were doing instead of from a third party intermediary perspective. We tried to frame what we were doing from an advocacy perspective. And we asked the question, how can we handle the inevitable confrontations that we have over our deeply held beliefs more constructively? And all of a sudden, people who didn't, weren't interested in compromise were very much interested in how they could confront one another more constructively. And we literally went from like a 95% rejection rate on invitations to something like a 95% acceptance rate. This reframing from third party to first party was a big deal. Um, and then another story. Uh, we taught for years and years with the Peace and Conflict Studies program here at the University of Colorado and similar programs at the University of Denver and also at George Mason University. Now some of these programs were focused specifically on people who want to be intermediaries. But not counting that and those particular courses, in general, people who are interested in peace and conflict studies weren't interested in becoming intermediaries. They were interested in advancing some particular cause, whether it's social justice, protecting the environment, or whatever. And they understood that understanding conflict dynamics uh, was important to understanding how to be effective. And this all reflects an inherent tension between the interests of an intermediary and the interests of the parties. And that is something that has um, been sort of lurking in the background of the conflict and peace building field for a long, long time. And it is reflected in the use of the word neutral, for example, for a long time, uh, neutrals were considered synonymous with mediator or facilitator or arbitrator because they were neutral. Uh, but after a while, it emerged that nobody can really quite be neutral. And even intermediaries sort of have this image of wise and equitable outcomes that they want to facilitate in one way or another. So there, again, was this tension, and even the field started to realize that they can't be truly neutral. 
This public skepticism about intermediary motives is reflected in what you might call the market share, the proportion of conflict interactions that are handled in destructive conflict as usual, sort of all-out confrontation ways, and the proportion that are handled uh, using peace building, conflict resolution, dispute resolution strategies. Uh, this sort of wild estimate I think is overly charitable and it gives peace builders maybe 10% market share. The truth is I doubt they have that. And so part of what we need to do is to figure out how to expand that market share. And we think the reframing in terms of constructive confrontation is the way to do that. The other thing to keep in mind is that instinctual confrontation, all out, let's fight it out strategies are really very destructive. And people, I think, even when they're engaged in those, have this sense that I don't really want to be doing this, but I don't see a way out. I mean, there's certainly terrible costs, and depending on the nature of the conflict, you can have people killed. There's certainly injuries, both physical and psychological, property damage. There's the cost of deterrence and unnecessary fighting, the lost ability to pursue mutually beneficial opportunities, damage relationships, all of these things. So people understand this, and what we need to do, and what we're trying to do with the Constructive Confrontation Initiative, is to show folks how a more sophisticated understanding of the insights of the conflict and peace building fields can help them be better advocates. Now this is, of course, nothing really very new. If you go back and you look at the list of Nobel Peace Prize winners, and there are always a few that are kind of odd, but the guys who are really famous and deservedly so, uh, Gandhi, Mandela, King, you know, are sort of certainly examples, but there are lots of other guys like this. What they did was not act as an intermediator. They were advocates for social justice and particularly difficult circumstances that were able to bring together the principles of nonviolence and all of the insights of the conflict and peace building fields in a way that made them much more effective. And so this is really the, I think the best way of framing uh, this massively parallel peace building project and the sort of associated constructive confrontation project. And that's what we're trying to do as we develop this constructive confrontation initiative, which will be in closely interlinked with massively parallel peace building. Um, and there are a lot of different goals of all of this. Uh, but just give you a sense of constructive confrontation. It wants to limit opposition. Now, if you want to be a good advocate, you limit opposition, but you do so in a sustainable way. So it's not just putting down the opposition or getting around them over the short term, um, but over the long term. And the same with building support. It needs to be sustainable. So a trick that works for a little while, but people find out about and get mad about, uh, doesn't do you much good. And there are all sorts of different actions that might be undertaken in this context. Just to give you a few examples, and we've got over a hundred actually tied up in this whole massively parallel peace building effort. Uh, one is to frame your aspirations in widely supported ways. This is Martin Luther King's plea to, for Americans to live out the true meaning of their creed. You want to minimize the use of force, which tends to generate a backlash and rely on persuasion and exchange. You want to be respectful, even with folks you disagree. Find ways to ratchet down rather than up tensions. At any rate, there are a lot of ideas on this, and if we get to subsequent sideshows, we'll start to go into them in more detail, and ultimately, we hope to have, and again, we're soliciting donations here, um, uh, posts on each of the things that people can do to help address the problem. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that neutrals and intermediaries don't have a role to play, uh, because that's just not true. Um, I spent a lot of time as a younger fellow 
uh, doing mountain rescue in Colorado. And in a sense, third-party intermediaries are rescuers. Uh, conflict situations can deteriorate to the point where the parties really are not capable of digging themselves out alone. They need to be rescued. And the truth is that's what a really good facilitator, mediator, or arbitrator um, can do, is they can help get around these things. So part of what you need is a comprehensive constructive confrontation approach is what you might call a consumer reports for intermediary services. So advocates know what intermediaries can do to help them and how to take advantage of them. Another way in which traditional intermediaries can help is in capacity building. Uh, intermediaries have a long history of teaching people about conflict dynamics and how to navigate them more constructively. All you need to do is to re-spin a lot of these presentations in a constructive confrontation advocacy oriented way. And there will be a huge need and hopefully something of a market for people who can teach people constructive confrontation and again, these insights. But the bottom line is that the real key to promoting massively parallel peace building or more constructive approaches to conflict is to show the people who are fighting, the advocates, that it is in their enlightened self-interest to take advantage of these techniques.